Amen. Father, we bless our kids and thank you for all the people that care for them and minister to their hearts. Well, we are blessed today to have such a powerful and anointed man of God. Jim and Kathy LaFoon have been in ministry since they were two years old. I mean, most, maybe most of their life. And uh, we got to know them about 20-something years ago over in Maui as we were doing the conference that we do there every year and got to co-labor at that prophetic conference, just a powerful release that God brings every year. And we just got connected in love and in family and in all the ways that uh, we co-labor for the kingdom and kind of become a little reliant upon each other in some ways where we pass things by each other, pray over each other's families and the things that God gives to us by revelation. And uh, he's been such an inspiration. I remember a very clear word. I must have preached everything out of that word back in 2000, I think, six or seven when the downturn happened and the Lord showed him this whole vision, and I won't go into it about a racehorse and the, the ditch and, and breaking the both legs and all that it meant. Anyhow, he said, God said it's uh, going to be uh, a recession, not a depression. And I don't know about you, but we hit it hard, and the skids hit strong here in this part of Florida. And so I just took that word to heart and just began to devour it. I preached it around the nations and just decreed, uh, hey, God's going to break. But God said there's a depression that the enemy's trying to bring, but he's going to break that. Uh, but that God had a plan through what we were going through at that time. And so it's so good to have the word of the Lord in times of darkness, in times of uh, blessing, no matter when. We we want to hear what God has to say. So uh, Prophet Jim LaFoon has been almost every nation of the earth. He's ministered to presidents and kings and senators, and I've been with him in the Philippines. We're ministered over a lot of officials uh, and just has such a powerful word and such a release of revelation that God has given to him. Uh, but more than that, he's a real person. His family has gone through things, but they're overcomers. They're always on the uh, tip of the sword, uh, willing to bring the breakthrough that God wants to bring for our nation, for the nations of the earth. And so we're really privileged and honored to have a man of his caliber here, right here in Santa Rosa Beach at Vision Church. And so let's give a wonderful welcome to Prophet Jim LaFoon as he comes to minister to us today and all that the Lord wants to bring through him. Amen. All right, you can be seated. I'm going to start down here and prosper with people. First of all, Kathy and I, you know, Kathy herself is 39, like Jane. They've, she's not had birthdays for decades now. Just kidding. But anyway, she and Jane are both 39. I am 69. Tom's 79. But he didn't want to say that. But, but humor aside, we're always honored to come here. We deeply honor the bishop. I consider him the father of modern-day prophecy. He's, he's done more to bring prophecy to the body of Christ than any other man I know. I will say T Tom and Jane are dear friends. They're great prophets, apostolic, all of it. They're just better Christians. And um, I'm more impressed with character than I am anointing. Anointing is a gift. Character is a choice you make every day. You couldn't be more blessed to have them. Um, I always love coming here every year, and I have come for years with Kathy. Um, it's honestly a respite for me to be in the presence of God. One of the reasons I so trust Tom and Jane explicitly is that they also pastor and love people. A lot of prophetic apostolic people don't really pastor anyone, and they can tear churches up. So I'm always blessed to be here. You are blessed um, to have them. Um, I just turned 69. I can't believe you go, you look 39. Thank you. You're so very discerning. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to process over a few people, then I'm going to stand and speak. There was a young woman on the worship team wearing a red dress, African-American. I need you to come up. Thank you. All right. She's, the right one's coming up is all I can say. Okay. Come up, great young woman. How old might you be? Are you married or single? I'm single. All right. All right, that's not going to stay. That's a different matter. <laughs> Kathy, come up here with me. All right, where were you born? I was born in North Carolina, but I claim Hawaii as my home. Where, where in North Carolina were you born? I was born in Fayetteville. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Military family, maybe? Military family. Of course. Kathy, come up and pray over with me. Why don't we? Deborah? Deborah. Spell your name for me. D-E-B-O-R-A-H. 
my hands on you very unusually, says the Lord. I want you to know you can touch my heart and worship, but there's a budding gift of prophecy which will flow out of you like a river. In fact, says the Lord, you'll end up a seer as well. You'll see things. You'll feel things. You'll know things. Um, you've known my sparing hand as a little girl. There were things that rippled through your family very hard before you were 10. Uh, there was some tearing in the lives of those you loved. In fact, you knew a time where I literally spared your mother from death. I want you to know you come from a generation and generations back of very godly women, women who prayed, women who heard me, women who loved me. And the hand of the Lord is going to rest on you very powerfully. In fact, says the Lord, over the next five years, there will be an exponential growth of the anointing of the Holy Spirit in you. You'll prophesy, you'll dream, you'll see things. I mean, you knew what it was to feel frail as a young girl. Different sicknesses and things would come to buffet you. There were things in your throat. There were things in your chest, like even asthmatic things, which would affect your sleep. Put your hand on your chest for me, Kathy. But I'm coming now, and I want you to know you're going to breathe freely. The hand of my spirit's going to be on you. Um, you're going to grow stronger and stronger and stronger. Even how I, I brought you to this church was kind of a miraculous thing, says the Lord. Uh, you were very intentional about it. I sent you here. I put you here. You're in the right place at the right time. Um, you're not to worry, says the Lord, but as you cross the 30 threshold, you'll cross into a new dimension of my spirit and presence. By the time you're 35, other nations other than this one will jump in your minds again. Even at 16, says the Lord, nations would come to you. I want you to know I'm going to bless you and touch you. Do you have siblings, by the way? I have one younger sister. Okay. What are your, what are your parents' names? Anthony and Regina. My dad's right there on the camera. Where is he? Man of faith. Well, get down here. Why don't you? Get off that camera and come up. Is your mom around? No, sir. Okay. Can I, can I yeah, of course you can. Yeah, absolutely. The Lord showed me a picture of this beautiful uh, bulb, like a tulip bulb. And he said, you've thought you've bloomed before. And you said, Lord, I'm a little afraid to bloom again. And he said, not to worry. This bloom is going to last and last and last. And your 30th year will be a time of blooming. And you're actually, just like bulbs in the ground, you're actually going to multiply. There won't just be one you'll have lots of, lots of flowers coming out of that one bulb. God's going to multiply you. Amen? Amen. Tell me your name, great man of God. Anthony. Anthony, come up by your daughter. I'm going to bat better on this side. I can feel weaker over here. Okay, here you are. <laughs> Anthony, you're a really faithful man. You went through a five-year season when the enemy was trying to rob you. I thought, man, the enemy is trying to rob me of that which I love most. Uh, you're uniquely talented, quite honestly, you're like a Swiss army knife. There's nothing you can't do can't fix, can't accomplish. You're like a super deacon for that matter. You're technological and you're, you have a very, very quick hands. You've always been very adept and you have known my sparing hand on your life, says the Lord. I kept you, in fact, not once but twice, I kept your life. Once as a boy, once as a man, you knew my sparing hand. Um, you, you have deep roots of faith in at least one side of your family, deep love for God. And I want you to know I brought you here, says the Lord, not just to preserve you, but to anoint you and use you. You're no one's sucker. You're naturally very wary. Uh, you went through a time in your life when trusting people wasn't the easiest thing for you. You knew what it was for things to blow up in your life. But I'm so proud of the man you are, so proud of the father you are. And my hand is coming on you more and more, and I'm going to restore what was robbed from you. There was even a financial robbery in your life. I don't mean like someone robbed you, but you got robbed of things that were yours, robs of pay that were yours. It's almost like you got wiped from back pay, things owed you. And I'm coming around to restore that which was stolen from you, says the Lord. I want you to know, says the Lord, your joints are going to stay supple and flexible. You went through an interesting thing where you felt like, almost like there was some numbness in your body, things attacking your limbs. I kept you from that out of your spine. Your greatest days are ahead. Don't be afraid. Is your younger sister around anywhere? She's at home, too. Okay. Where's home? Um, just across the street. Okay. Um, well, how, how old is your sister? She's 28. There's a fresh touch of my spirit coming on your sister. She's very precious. But she went through a two-year period where there was some scree under her feet. It was hard for her to find her traction. But my fresh grace has come to her, and I'm helping her. Uh, there was some wounding in her soul as well, not from family but outside of family. And there was some bleeding from something she had put her hopes in. It did not come to pass. But my grace and power are coming on her. Watch what I do. Thank you very much. Thank you.
All right. There is a couple that stood up. I think they just had a 10-year anniversary. Come up, Erica and Jessica. I knew that. I know. Tom could have never remembered. I know. This side. What's your name? Jessica. Jessica. I should have remembered that. Eric. Do you guys have children? We do. We have four. Okay. Names and ages starting with the oldest. Caden is 17. Okay. Alicia is 15. All right. Brooklyn is eight. And Benjamin is six. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay. Yours, hers, how does that all fit out? Yours? I was married before. Okay. It's fine. Just try. And then he was adopted the first two, and then we had two more together. Wonderful. Okay. Great. Son, my hand's on you. You're very precious. You're very tender. Um, in fact, there's a unique pastoral capacity that even flows out of your life. I want you to know I'm going to make the two of you restorers in the house of God, says the Lord. Uh, son, my hand's on you. Um, I'm getting ready to unlock your finances for what you're called to do in a whole different level. Uh, you went through a three-year financial battle to believe. In fact, you're still not quite out of the battle. But I'm here to tell you, I'm unlocking, says the Lord, what was stolen with you. How old might you be? 37. 37. Yeah. Um, 30, 30 was an interesting turnaround year for you. Um, at 30, a dream got traction, says the Lord. Um, there's some deep Christian workings in at least part of your family, even some religious things. You have felt the call of God budging on your shoulders. You're not the first one. In fact, there, were, there was like a robbed calling in your family line. Um, there were things that facts says the Lord uh, that came against your dad. Like he had a lot of talent, a lot of grace, but it's like the enemy tried to cut part of his calling away. And I'm here to tell you, says the Lord, the double portion of my spirit and hand is going to be upon you. And I'm going to use the two of you. Uh, there will be an arm of deliverance which flows out of you. And I'm going to touch you by my spirit. What's your oldest child's name? Caden. How old? 17. Boy, girl? Boy. My hand's on him. You're not to be afraid, daughter. He's very strong. But in some of the transitions you went through, some pain entered his heart that locked him down for a season. It's like he got locked jaw. His, his mouth just became closed when it came to faith for a season. But I am unlocking that, and my hand is going to be on him. Uh, there was a tearing wound. In fact, you yourself got ambushed at a season in life. It's like life, it was one of those quick ambushes where life just crashed down on you. And I'm so proud of the woman you are, says the Lord. In fact, there's a very prophetic thing that works on you as well. You hear me, you know me, you love me. And didn't I promise to restore to you every year the enemy is robbed away? What's your second child's name? Alicia. How old is she? My hands on her. You love her dearly. Her own heart's had some of its own tearing in it. Very tender, says the Lord. But there was some implosion in her heart that worried you. And I'm reaching out to that precious one. It's like she went through a season where it's like her, her heart got zipped up very tight. But I have slowly but surely been opening it by my presence and by my spirit. And I'm here to tell you, you've only begun to see what I'm going to do in her. The hand of the Lord is going to flow out of her like a river. There's a worshiping thing on her as well that I'm going to bring to the forefront. There's creativity. There's music. There's so many things in her. Watch what I do. She is going to flower. She's very lovely, says the Lord. She's a lovely little girl. She's a lovely young woman now, says the Lord. But her heart will far surpass her face when I'm done, and I will bless her, surely bless her. What are your other two kids? My hands on, is Brooklyn a girl, by the way? Mm -hmm. My hands on Brooklyn. She's a bright little rascal, uh, very chipper, very outgoing. She'd take over the whole family if you'd let her. She always has a better idea. But is she around? She's in church. Good, but I will use her and bless her. I mean, she'll have quite a gift of speaking, quite a gift of breaking things down. I've even worked a bit in her learning style, so you're not to be worried about that. My hand is on her. Benjamin's named by the Spirit. He'll be a strong man filled with the love of God. He'll have massively high EQ. 
He'll be a friend of many with a huge heart. He was such a cute little rascal, stumbling over things, falling down, rarely crying, kind of clumsy growing up. And he will grow into a fine man. My hand's on the two of you. The story of your life is this. What the enemy meant for evil, I have meant for good. And I will bless you and use you and touch you. Watch me, says the Lord. Thank you very much. Let's give the Lord a clap. Thank you guys so much. I want to call, call let's see, one, two, three, four, fourth row. You're on the end, sir. I think your shirt's kind of gray. Nod your head. I am talking to you. Is that, is that your wife next to you? I, I thought it was your daughter for a moment. Okay, bring her up. Okay, come up. Thank you very much. What's your name, sir? John, very, very nice to meet you. What's your name? Hi, Catherine. Is that a C or a K? Okay. Okay. Very good. You have children, by the way? Yes. How many? Six. That's plenty for sure. <laughs> Start with the first one and tell me their names. John Andrew. How old is John? He'll be 31 and 20. Okay. You look way too young to have a 31 year old son. <laughs> 32. 32. Thank you. Very good. Good, good. Second? Rachel. How old? How do you have kids that old? I don't know. You're drinking from the fountain of you. Third one? Third one is uh, Ashley. Ashley, 28. Okay. Fourth? Fourth one is Carly. She is 25. Okay. Um, fifth one is Sarah Catherine. She's also 25. Linda Coleman. Okay. And the sixth one is Kelly. She's 24. So how many boys? Mostly girls. One. I thought one boy. Yes. Five girls. Yes. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> Your youngest daughter, his name is? Kelly. Very bright, yes. very articulate. Um, she's been finding fresh traction in life and faith. Um, she's unusually wired in the family, too, mm -hmm. with an unusual set of emotions. Um, she's quite a big feeler, if you want to know the truth about it. She's like a little thermostat. She can set the whole emotional level of the family. Very, very lovely girl. Sometimes you feel like you worry she has more mercy than she has sense about things. She drag a lot of things home. Very soft, precious touch. And my hand is coming on her, and she came out of some of the pain you all went through with an unusual wound in her heart is the fact of it. Slow to recover. But my spirit and my presence are coming on her. Watch what I do. The boy is your son by marriage. He's strong now. He's a lot like you. Um, very strong. Very sharp. Um, he's not yet known the full plan of God for his life. You're not to be afraid of that. He's loaded with talent. But he goes through periods of aimlessness that you don't know what to do. It's been hard for him to stick to like any one thing. I'm here to tell you. You watch what I do. My hand is on John, named after you, I would assume. He's very entrepreneurial, very creative. Even as a boy, he was like thinking about money and saving it and doing things. I'm here to tell you, John, you're not to worry about little John. The hand of the Lord <laughs> will bring him out of an aimlessness into everything I have for him. There's been some crisis in his identity as well. Uh, there's been some brokenness in his identity. Never have you seen so much potential, but it can be very frustrating for you. And I'm reaching out to touch him. Who is next? Rachel. Rachel. <clears throat> Where's Rachel from? Which of you? Um, she lives in Atlanta. Okay. Who, which, who's? My daughter. Your daughter. Married, single? Married. Okay. She's 20. 30. 30 is an important year for her. She's going to cross over into some great things. I mean, it's been a real, how long has she been married now? Since 2015. Been some interesting years for them, especially for her husband. Um, he's, he's very, very sharp, very quick, but he doesn't carry weight well all the time. And he can kind of crumple under the burdens of things. And, uh, you're not to be afraid when you see that happen. You're to know I'm raising them up. And my touch is coming on them even more deeply. 
They've had a real uphill climb in a business endeavor. Like they feel like it's taken hands and feet to climb. I'm going to meet them and touch them. John, you're a unique man. You're a super hard worker. Um, and you've got a golden touch on your life. You've had your seasons of making finances, making money. You knew what it is where work was almost the number one life you had. You worked. You worked. Your dad hit some hard things, and you were robbed of some things as a child. Like some people have rags to riches stories. Yours was almost reversed. Um, your dad experienced great loss at a key age that even affected him physiologically. But what was lost to you, as the Apostle Paul said, that which I counted gain, I, loss I now count as gain, God truly, deeply touched you. And you've been in an interesting five years of restoration. He's restoring lost finances. He's restoring things. When, when you were hit with a hurricane, you almost didn't care what you lost. But you've only begun to see the salvation of the Lord. I brought an incredible woman along to you. She's filled with faith. She loves me. Daughter, you knew it was to feel left high and dry. Life slammed you. Um, you grew up with some good nurture, even though there was brokenness in your family. Um, your mom was a very unique woman, very talented, very beautiful. Um, and she imparted some good things to you, though her own life hits a hard wall. Um, do you have sisters, by the way? Yes. Brothers? I want you to know um, my hand's on you. There's an anointing on both of you. John, there's just a strong gift of leadership in you. The fact of it is you used to make a living rescuing things, knowing what to do. You've never lacked it. Um, is this where you normally go to church, or are you part of this church? No, we live up in Vietnam. Yeah, and uh, where are you in church there? Uh, Restoration Church. Good. Uh, who? Restoration Church in Alpharetta, Pastor Jeff Ramsey. Okay, my hand's on the two of you. you. Sometimes it's hard to get you off the back row, but there's a tremendous leadership gift in you. Daughter, my hand's on you. You're very articulate. There's a gift of teaching. Watch what I do. Let's give them a hand. Well, all righty. I'm going to get up here and speak. You notice I brought my iPad and my Bible because I had a prepared message, but I almost just opened my Bible and preached out of my Bible. But then the Lord said, no, go back to your iPad. So we'll try one of it in good. I'll try the second. Okay, all righty. We'll just sing. Holy Spirit, help us. What an hour we find ourselves in. And so I'll be prophetic for a few minutes, and I want to talk about how do we live in this hour where we can thrive, not just survive. I'm going to entitle this message, Peace on Earth, is it a fairy tale or a faith promise? In Luke 2, 13 through 14, there was a mighty angelic visitation. You know the story. We're coming to the Christmas season. The angels were there. A heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. That means no matter what time, no matter what is happening in our world, and I'll comment on some of that in a moment, you can experience peace. No matter what you're going through, and it's important that we do, because it says in the end, God raises up a breed of men and women who are wells of living water, shade in the heat. Now, when you think of where they were living, this promise was given at a time of terror, oppression, fear, and upheaval. They were under the boot of Rome, crucified, taxed. They'd been deeply shattered by Babylon, by Assyria hundreds of years before. They were in a nation of great oppression. They were in a nation 
that in fact in 70 years their capital would be wiped out and they could not return for 2,000 years. How's, how's peace possible? How do we find peace in a situation like that? Let's talk about our own day. We've gone through some rough, rough years. Seems like in, in, at 9-11, things changed. Worst casualties since the Civil War in American soil. Tom commented, worst the Great Recession, worst downturn since the Great Depression, followed by the worst pandemic since the Spanish flu. Now we have the most terrifying war in Europe since World War II, and the Middle East is in upheaval. Like, what would the Spirit of God say about that? Was he surprised? As Tom and Jane know, God does nothing in the world without telling someone. And I've had my share of things God's told me starting in the end of 2018 and into 2019 and about what would come and all the polarization in our country and COVID and all kinds of things. But I want to fast forward to tell you where I think we are. On June 9th, I had a vision. And this is in 2022. As we came out of COVID, the Lord had told me America would be whole, terrifyingly broken, shattered, but that we would not end in basically some type of rebellion. We weren't going to fall apart. We weren't going to end up in anarchy. We'd end up in revival. And on June 9th, 2022, as Tom and Jane know and Kathy, I saw Jesus walking across America and his tears were on the ground, crying. And I began to hear him pray to his father one more time, one more time, one more time. His father said, okay. And drops began to fall from heaven. They were so powerful when they'd hit the burning soil They'd create ecosystems. And Jesus said, Jim, it's not business as usual anymore. Two days later, he said, you've come to an inflection point in history. But the first drops are falling. Don't waste them. As I carried that word, I was in Texas August 22nd. He said, Jim, I want to make you a rainmaker. And he said, the clouds of my presence will now come. The churches all over America and the world. But what the Lord finds on the ground will determine how much it rains. What he finds. You live in an area of the world, Florida has more than any other state of thunderstorms. I do too. They're really stacked cumulus clouds that come in basically a pillar. That's familiar. But what determines what happens when the cloud of God comes is the atmosphere on the ground. The heat, the passion, the tears. August 24th, I was in Birmingham, Alabama to visit a friend. I laid down for a nap and I said, Lord, what about the rest of the world? Are we really coming into this time of revival? Are we really coming into this time of visitation? I was taken to the UK. This is all documented. No one knew the queen was sick. And the Union Jack was flying at half mast. And all the UK was just in mourning. I thought, my Lord, what's died? Jesus stepped out onto the stage of the UK, grabbed the lanyard on the flag mast, jerked it. The Union Jack went screaming to the top. Lightning flashed. And Jesus said this, I've not forgotten my promises. I'm going to restore my glory. In fact, I'm going to open the ancient wells of revival all over the world. A week later, he said this, when the Queen of England dies, you will know revival's imminent. These things kept my heart. And I have many well-placed friends in England, like brilliant observers, business leaders, church leaders. And they said, they said when the Queen died and they lowered the flag mast, this is no joke, and you saw the pictures, it's really real, rainbows would come over the flags. One of my friends, one of the key financiers in all of England, because they're one of the most brilliant men in the country. He didn't make anything up. He said, when she died, rain clouds in the shape of 
the queen's hat would, could be seen over the country. One of the greatest religious leaders in the country told me he had never seen the like of it. Churches filled up, people weeping. He said, indeed, the first drops were falling. On January 1st of this year, I had sinus surgery in December, so I was sleeping in a recliner. It was 1.45 in the morning I woke up, which isn't unusual after sinus surgery. 1.45 in the morning, the Lord said, go, get out of that recliner, go into your office, I'm going to speak to you. And I hear I'll share more clearly on a Sunday morning than I would in most places, but there was like a clamor in the heavens, an unusual clamor. I've rarely seen the like of it where it's like the angels are crying out, the earth is off course, the earth is off course, the earth is off course, it's heading to destruction. It's almost like metaphorically I could see the earth coming out of its axis, but it was spiritual. And then God spoke this to me. He said, welcome to the turning point year. Welcome to the year of turning points. The sabers are going to rattle. The world is going to be afraid. In other words, it's going to come to the brink of war. He said, I'm here to tell you, when that happens, do not be afraid. And I might add, we're sitting in the middle of that now. When that happens, do not be afraid. I will save the world. I'm preparing it for the move of my spirit. Now, I truly believe that. On February 3rd, 2023, I was sitting in front of my map in my office never forget as long as I live. I saw giant thunderheads begin to come toward the United States. He said, I'm going to give you a storm warning. First drops are falling, but I'm here to tell you, Jim, that thunderstorms of my spirit are coming to America. On February 8th, the Asbury visitation broke out. My larger family, we have a church there. Professors go there, people involved. We're sitting about 30, 40 minutes away. And the inside story is the guy that preached told his wife one of the worst sermons I've ever preached. A few kids stayed. This is the first time revivals ever met social media. They began to tell the presence of God grew and grew and never left for 14 to 15 days. There were a million hits on Asbury Revival on TikTok. 70,000 people came. There's two lights in the town. There'd be two and a half mile lines of cars. Kids were jerking their mattresses into the auditorium. The auditorium's very austere, no accoutrements, not cool, all wood. Jesus came. 200 other nations were influenced. I might add in the Jesus Revolution of 1970, the same thing happened at Asbury, but shorter. So where are we? What's God doing later? Sitting in a great church, I saw the heavens open. And I saw just this, like this biggest warehouse I've ever seen. And in it were all these giant water trailers and water cars and pools. Everyone with a church name. An outpouring of the Spirit was coming. But what do we expect it would be like? How many of you know God has to shake things before the Spirit of God comes? Churches are shaking. Ministries are shaking. But beloved, do not be afraid. We are right on course. I'll never forget when the Lord showed me the Ukraine war and I told our leaders that Russia would be attacking you, but you were not to be afraid that he would slap the paw of the bear. The lion of Judah was greater than the bear. He told me, I was sitting in my office before the war. He said, next week, they're going to attack Ukraine, but don't be afraid, Jim. It'll prove worse than Afghanistan for the armies of Russia. I'm moving there. In fact, I'll raise up Ukraine to be an apostolic nation and shake Eastern Europe. Watch what I do. Love Russia's work with churches there. Not talking about great Russian people. Here we are. But the problem is, in the middle of all this, how do you keep your peace? In the middle of such turmoil, such pain, what are God's promises? What does he say? Now, the fact of it is, he says in Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, and he'll be called one of his names, the Prince of Peace. Here to tell you today, no matter what's in your family, no matter what is with your children, 
No matter what, Kathy and I were fellowshipping with Tom and Jane, prophets, apostles, did Tom and Jane to me, sorry. But we were fellowshipping, and they will tell you, we've lived in relentless hell for years now. So much warfare. The devil knows his time is short. He's frightened. When I heard that the, the Knesset had called for a day of prayer, is that normal, Jane? I didn't think so. I've cried out that God would use this terrible tragedy in Israel to bring that nation to its spiritual knees and cry out for their Messiah. I'm praying that. So he also says in Isaiah 26, 3, he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. So he'll guard our heart, but like, how does that happen and why is it so important? John 16, 33 says, in a world filled with pain, despair, and uncertainty. What's it say? It says this, I've told you these things that you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. How do we find it? How in your personal life? I mean, we're, we're, whether it's a global economy, interest rates, war, pandemic. May I say to those of you who are young, those of you under 30, why would God allow you to be born in a 20-year war, the second worst economy after the Great Depression and the worst pandemic since the Spanish flu? Because you are the next greatest generation. And the Spirit of God will revival you and touch you. I'm a Jesus Movement baby, swept my high school in 1971 in California. So is Kathy, Catholic Charismatic Movement, 100 million Catholics saved, baptized in the Spirit. It's coming again. But I don't want you to panic. I want you to enjoy the peace of God. And how many of you know when you're, when you're anxious, it's no joke. It affects your sleep. It affects your digestion. And if you cannot quiet your soul, you'll have no confidence. How do you find peace right now? Some of you know back in 2020 in COVID, I was visited by a six-foot six African-American in Atlanta. I know now he was probably an angel. We walked out of the men's bathroom. He pointed down and he said, you know what God has told you. Don't act worried. Don't be afraid. What did you think it would take to bring revival to America? He said, don't be afraid. Revival's coming. You're not wrong. And he said goodbye and disappeared into the crowd. That was more than likely an angel. Anyway, okay, now. Like, where's this process? How's it work? In our complex world. But I tell you this. We are in the early days of what I believe to be the greatest revival in my lifetime. A generation will be swept away. No nation will be untouched. You watch what God does in the world. It'll stagger you. But what was it going to take? It had to get like this. And may I tell you, everything that can be shaken is being shaken now. Our own nation has not been this polarized since the 1840s. People are so afraid. Let me tell you, the future of America, a revival outpouring of God's Spirit. But how do we walk in this? How do we flow in this? How does this happen? Jesus says in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, but it does not work like the world's peace. There is a peace from God regardless of the bad news you're facing. I'll never forget many, many years ago when Kathy was being treated for thyroid cancer, they radiated her, she had a stroke, and they said, we're so sorry, we believe that cancer's in your wife's brain, go home and be with your children, four small children. The peace of God was so powerful that it suffocated my anxiety, and I prayed for missions all the way home. How does this happen? How do we find it? Kathy and I have plenty to be anxious about right now. Tom and Jane have plenty to be anxious about right now. In the world, you'll have tribulation. How do you find this peace? Here's why. God's peace is counterintuitive. It's not a fruit 
of your circumstance. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. No matter what you're facing today, no matter how anxiety ridden you are today, no matter what you're going to go home to after this little respite, no matter what your checkbook's like, no matter what the doctor said, no matter what pain, may I tell you, peace is his promise. Now, like, how's this work? And I so wanted to be prophetic the whole message. God said, don't do it. Practically speaking, I live in crisis. I've laid dying. God's healed me. They've told me there's no help for Kathy. Our first son, I, second son I came home, he was neonatal intensive care. Like they had no answer for him. Our third son got a parasite serving God in the West Bank. He played college football at 228 pounds, went down to 107 pounds, skin peeling off his body. They remember dying in our arms. Listen, and I, and I could tell you story after story about your pastors. Where, how do you find peace? What do you do when your spirit-filled doctor tells you, quit the ministry, there's no hope for you? I didn't listen to him. He was a great man of God, one of the best doctors in the country. How do you find peace? Like, in a world in such tumult, in a world, and may I tell you, those that don't know Christ are far more afraid than you. I'll never forget my foray into the White House, my first one, an incredible woman, one of the most, second most powerful woman in the world, called me. She was, we, talk, we started talking in tongues on the phone. I was very young, and she said, Jim, my president, the president and my husband, his best friend, they're baby Christians. They're scared to death. They don't know what to do. If you think you're scared, try me. Now, how does this work? Let me just say a few things to you. Number one, it starts by laying a biblical foundation. Isaiah 26, 3 says this, first part of the verse. You'll keep him in perfect peace. That's double shalom in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, peace is not the absence of conflict. It is the presence of God that gives you peace no matter what you're feeling. Beloved, I face death. Face death in my own life the life of my wife, in the life of children. And I'm telling you, the peace of God has never failed. How does that happen? Well, it says you'll keep him in double shalom whose mind is stayed on you. In the Hebrew word, that word stayed is the word steadfast. It needs to be founded on or to rest on something. In other words, if you're resting on what you see instead of what God says, you'll never have peace. That no matter what I go through, no matter what my finance look, no matter what my health, like, I've had this thing in the left side of my body. I thought, you know, doctors got all worried. We're going to give you every test. Maybe you've had a mini stroke. God said, you ain't had anything. The doctor got done. He goes, well, there ain't nothing wrong with you. You know, so, but that's life. We're going to always face things that shake us. But here's where I live. I don't sit on my circumstances. I sit on the Word. I can't live by what I see. I don't deny reality, but I've put my confidence in a greater reality. Then it goes on to say, because he trusts in you. If you're ultimately relying on anything other than God, you'll have trouble having peace. I, I pray for godly leadership, but they're not my hope. I pray for godly president. We've had some and some not so godly, some not godly at all. But the fact of it is, my peace is not based on who's president. My peace is not based on the economy. I live on God's economy, not the world's economy. My peace is based on what he says and who he is. Because he trusts in you. Now, once you begin to understand that foundation, there's a process where you begin to learn to give God your burdens. Now watch this. 
The Bible says, don't be anxious about anything. How many of you know that's almost ludicrous? <laughs> I feel like saying, hey, you live up there. It's worse down here. He goes, let me remind you, I did become one of you and walk down here. I get it. So if he says, do not be anxious, that means there's a choice. You don't have to be. Now, here is what I've learned, and here is what I practice. I love, I told Kevin, I'm getting a little respite. We're going to worship. We're going to pray. We're going to prophesy. We're going to decree. But when I go out that door, I've got friends I love who are dying right now. Friends in serious trouble. I've got kids I'm bleeding for. I mean, this is a respite. I love it. But I'm going to walk out those doors to that reality. If you don't learn to biblically manage your anxieties, you won't have peace. How do you do that? It's like Paul's a good neuroscientist. He says, put off anxiety and put this on. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Let me make that very simple. You must choose between worrying about your anxieties or worshiping through your anxieties. So I live with a pattern of worshiping through my anxieties. When, when Robert, I, I just worry, God, Robert's dying, there's no hope. The doc, I'd say, Lord, I thank you that you can heal Robert. I worship you now. I give thanks that Robert. Now, why does going from worry to worship transform you? It says this, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. So Jesus says, if you worship through your anxieties instead of worrying through your anxieties, my peace will guard your heart, your digestive system, your sleep, your relationships. How does that happen? Now, not everything spiritual, it starts spiritual, but it becomes neurochemical. So basically, I'm face, I, I, this morning, I'm, I have multiple friends that are dying right now in the natural. That without a miracle, I have three dear friends that won't get better, they'll die. I have two, one had a stroke, one a traumatic brain injury. One of them is my 46-year friend. I, and I I'm, have responsibility with all of them. How do I handle it? Oh, my God, what about him? I go, the day I sing, I am the Lord that healeth thee, I just, you are the, I, by name, you are the Lord that healeth him. You are the Lord that healeth her. I just begin to worship God over it. Now, why? Because when, listen to me carefully, when you worship, here's what happens. When your spirit connects with God, like if I go down and touch my wife on the shoulder or Tom reaches and touches Jane or vice versa, their oxytocin levels will change in five seconds. In fact, when you're touched by someone you love or you feel safe, your serotonin levels change, your dopamine levels change, and you are showered with feel-good neurochemicals. And guess what? Even though so nothing's changed, your psychology changes. And when that's why you feel so good in church. Because when you're loved by God and his presence is touching you, it's not just spiritual. You are showered with neurochemicals that affect your psychological outlook. That maybe you still have anxieties, but you feel so loved by God, it's transformative. Well, could it be you should do that at home? Could it be you should worship through your pain at home, worship through your finances at home? Yes, you should. Why? Because the peace of God will guard your heart. It'll guard your soul. It's hellacious right now. It's not easy. One thing I like about your church, because you actively address what we're all feeling every time you come together. Why are we prophesying? Why are we worshiping? Why are we decreeing? 
because we trigger God's presence and his spirit moves on us. Now watch this. You begin to deal with those anxieties. Now let's go a little deeper here. These are three things I practice to maintain, to maintain my peace in this hour. You know, it's interesting in Isaiah 30, 15 through 16, God said to Israel, thus says the Lord, the Holy One, in returning and rest, you'll be saved. In quietness and trust will be your strength. You are unwilling. No will flee upon horses. You will flee away. will ride on swift seeds. Your pursuers will be swifter. It's easy to fall back into the patterns of anxiety. And there are three things I practice regularly. Some of them I practice daily. Here's why. If you can't quiet your soul, you'll never be confident. You just won't. Be still and know that I'm God. It's good for a man or woman to wait. And if you can't quiet your soul from anxiety, that presence that brings you peace, it's hard to connect. I practice three things. Interdiction, interjection, and intercession. I love my eyes. How do I interdict anxiety? How do I live in such a way that God cuts that anxiety off? That's the first practice I practice. I regularly worship through my anxieties. May I tell you, having had an autoimmune disease which was destroying me at 33, before they knew what they were, it's the anxiety you're not conscious of that's more destructive than the anxiety you are. You think, well, it's out of my mind. If it's out of your mind, it may well be in your body. Like sometimes I just stop, and I begin to, I'll, I'll begin to worship through all the things I'm most anxious about. I do it regularly. Why? Because when I do that and God's peace comes on me, it guards my heart, it guards my soul, it guards my mind. You don't have to be anxiety risen. What you feel here, when you practice the presence of God at home, you can feel that same peace and that same rest. Yes, there's a corporate dynamic that can't be replaced, but at some total level, you can. Secondly, I do what I call interjection. When I'm deep in the cycle of anxiety, I interject what God says through what I call vertical shift. I do this every morning, ask my wife. I do this every night. Now it says, we walk by faith, not by sight. If you walk by what you see, not by what God says, you'll be anxious all the time. It's just truth. For me, I never deny reality, but what God says trumps everything for me. What if you're wrong? I'll die in peace, not anxious. It says in Romans 10, 6 to 10, but the righteousness based on faith says, don't say in your heart you've got to ascend up to heaven and bring Jesus down. Or you've got to go down into the abyss and fight hell and bring him up. But it says the very word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved with the heart you believe and are justified with a mouth you confess and are saved. Let me teach you. You will never overcome anxiety in your mind. It's like playing ping pong. When Robert was dying, and he's now a high altitude, ultra marathoner serving God. And I mean, he was dying. He was gone. Now he runs 105 miles and thousands of feet of elevation. Y'all didn't take after me, but that's another story. Okay, now. The only time I run 100 miles is in my car. Okay, now, watch this. When he was dying, that, 
I'd say, oh, my Robert, well, you're going to heal him. God says, heal him. Your brother died at 24. He's 24. Like it was always ping pong. You will never win the battle by believing in your heart if you don't connect the two by confessing with your mouth. And may I tell you by the Holy Spirit today, I don't spend a lot of time begging God for anything. I confess what he's promised me. I wake up in the morning. Lord, you've given me peace. It's not like the world gives. I went to bed last night. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You are my refuge. You are my hiding place. You are my high tower. The righteous run in and are saved. Lord, I say right now, you are healing, Robert. There's healing in your wings. I say right now, when I think of my friend Randy, one of the great intercessors, smitten by a stroke, you say the deaf hear, the dumb speak, the lame walk. I pray so loud sometimes my wife has to quiet me down. She always said, you pray real loud. I go, oh, baby, it's your imagination. Then I got my new Apple Watch, and I began to pray and said, leave that atmosphere eventually. You're destroying your hearing. That was my confession. I said, better death than hearing the devil. But anyway, I just confess that word. You say, it does it, it's just true. It is not enough to believe. You must confess. The battle is not one in your mind. It's one out of your mouth. I'm facing more death, more pain, more hurt. Joyce Myers, I forget what she told me. She said this. She said, I stopped a long time ago begging my Heavenly Father what he's promised me. I confess who I am and what he says. May I tell you, you can shift out of your depression. You can shift out of your unbelief. You can shift out of your anxiety. But you will not win the battle in your heart. You'll only win the battle when you connect your mouth and your heart. When I'm afraid, when I'm fighting, my body's breaking down. I've been so tired I can't move, joints freezing up. I was praying sometime a few months ago, my arm wouldn't move anymore. I, my, my, my beloved sister Jane has had a litany of things that have afflicted her. She's never once stopped. Those are light and momentary working in us a greater glory. But you can't win in your head. You're not going to win in your heart. It'll trample you. You'll wear out in that ping pong. You must confess what God says in the face of your hell. You must confess what he says. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what circumstances tell me. I mean, my wife, my Kathy should be dead. I should be dead. She was never going to drive again. She was never going to be well with all those seizures. She don't have a mark on her brain today by the healing power of God. Listen. You must lift up your anxieties. Don't go to bed without confessing who you are. I found that, you know, what I do is I just, I just Google it. What does the Bible say? about the peace of God. There's one site I'll remember in a minute. It's my favorite one. And then 30 verses, I'll just say, I've got peace like a river. I'm filled with peace. My mind is stayed on you. Your peace doesn't work like the world's peace. Lord, you're my refuge. You're my fortress. I feel sick. I'll say, you sent your word and healed them and delivered them from death. Well, what if you die? I'm in heaven. I'm going out in faith, not in unbelief. I will not cow down. I will not quit. I will not. You can't win in your mind. You will win in your mouth. Third and last thing. Yes, I interdict through giving my anxiety. Yes, I interject. But also, I will engage the enemy, I'll intercede. Beloved, listen to me. Stop living as a punching bag. Stop letting the devil, if you don't fight back, he'll beat you all the more. May I tell you, no matter what you do, he's going to attack you. 
The only choice you have is to fight back. The only choice. You know, raising all our kids, I'll never forget, we had, when our first biological daughter, we have some, some adopted ones now, and she had the stomach flu, and she was four years old. You'd have thought she was dying of brain cancer. And, and, I, and, I, I, and she goes, Daddy, what's that blue bowl? That's the vomit bowl. She goes, what's the globe for? That's your answer. If the devil makes you sick, make him sick. Put your four-year-old hand on that globe and pray for revival. Why? I'll strike him back. I'm going to hit him. Beloved, listen. We've not been at an inflection point in world history like this in a long time. There's never been a greater threat of nuclear war since the Cuban Missile Crisis. That's obvious. It's being threatened by Russia. Am I afraid? No, it's not the end of the world. It's the beginning of a great revival. But you were born for this. Strike him back. I pray, God, you're praying for revival among Israel and revival among the Palestinian people. I pray you're praying. Kathy and I, she'll tell you, we never go to bed without praying for revival in every continent. Every, why? Because I'm going to strike him back. Because I'm not helpless. You don't have to be Tom and Jane for your prayers to be heard. God hears your prayers the same. You can pray. You can intercede. You don't just have to worship in church or intercede in church. Every day, strike him. Every day, hit him. I tell the devil, I said, don't mock me, my enemy. Though I've fallen, I'll rise again. Though I've sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. I'll rise up at night in front of my world map, calling down revival, cursing the devil. At why? Because I'm at war. You, it isn't, you're going to be at war till you die. Just get ready. When will there be no war? When you die and you're in heaven or he comes back. You must strike him. What did you think it was going to be like for God to save America? How bad did you think it was going to have to get? God's going to sweep the earth. I see things I know to be true. Here we are. It's scary. It's probably going to get scarier. He's on the throne. Lift up your anxieties. Confess not what you feel, but who you are. And intercede. The devil needs to know, every time he strikes me, I'll strike that sucker back. When they told me Kathy was dying, God said, stop praying for your wife. She's fine. Pray for missions all the way home. Teach him. No matter what you try to take from me, I'll take back from you. If I go, I'm going down like this. My mom, 92. She's a prophetess and intercessor, as is my sister and her daughter. My mom has had rancid kidney failure healed. She's walked out of hospice. No one does that. She, I mean, she just laughs at 92. I just, in the prayer time, I saw this large demonic entity, and it says, I'm on the way to kill your mom about six months ago. I literally heard giant wings flapping, sorry. I said, Mom, I got worried about you last night. She goes, why would you worry about me? I thought the devil's going to kill you. She goes, come on. She said, there's never been a devil created. They're going to take your mama where she don't want to go. I said, Mama, do you have spiritual warfare? She goes, no, I wrestled the devil like the Bible says. Let me tell you, I want to go out like her. I want to go out like the bishop. That's how I'm going out. Listen to me. I know it's grim. I know there's lots of bad news. Here's what the Lord told me out of Isaiah when we hit this season. Don't call conspiracy what they call conspiracy. Don't fear what they fear. Don't dread what they dread. For I, the Lord, am the one that you should fear. You are living in the answer to decades of prayer. The world is being shaken. Only the church will not be shaken. Do not be afraid. 
giving you anxieties as you worship. Confess that word. I confess the word over my children, over our health. Kathy and I have plenty of things to be anxious about. I choose not to be. Intercede. Don't miss these prayer meetings. Don't miss the online times of tongues. I don't know how to pray good pray in tongues a bunch. You say today, I got some anxieties to exchange. Raise your hand right now. You ra you're facing anxiety. Stand to your feet. I'm going to pray for you. You just need the Lord's peace. We're all facing anxiety. I just determined to win. Holy Spirit, I'm always honored to be here in my vision family. That great CI world family. It's one of those special places where you dwell. Thank you that we're alive now. Thank you that we're in the middle of turmoil. And out of this turmoil, your mighty presence is coming. I pray they exchange worry for worship. I pray they'd connect their heart with their mouth. And I pray they'd go on the offensive. Amen. Pastor Tom. Wow. Can you give Prophet Jim just one more hand? We just love him so much. And what a powerful word. You may be seated for a moment. We do want to just take an offering and bless him and Kathy on their journey and of ministry that they do for the Lord. They are so obedient. Some of you have sown. We sow into the word sometimes when we just feel like that really wants to be released to us that we sow into it. But I'm going to get everybody a chance right now. If you want to make out a check, again, make it out to Vision Church. Or if you want to uh, go online or text to give, you can see the information, Vision Church CI to 77977. But everything you give in this offering will go toward the blessing that we want to give to him. We so appreciate his heart to minister prophetically, to minister the word of the Lord. He's a man of revelation, vision, and impartation. And... Uh, I'm just so happy that he hears from heaven like he does and so uh, willing to release what God gives to him. He's been uh, one that's a soldier and a faithful man in everything that he has done for the Lord over all these years. And we get a chance just to be a part of that legacy and of that ministry as we sow right now. So as you prepare your offering, let's just uh, pray over it and agree together. Father, we're thankful for today. We're thankful for the impartation of peace. You are the prince. Of peace. You are our shalom. You're the one that has uh, risen up to fight for us and that we can have peace, that you know how to keep us safe in the storm. You know how to grace us in every time of our life. And we thank you for the word of the Lord that we can confront every assignment of the enemy and see the breakthrough you have determined to bring. And so, Father, we bless, we sow into the word, into the man of God, and into the work of the kingdom. And we're thankful for the opportunity. We give you all the praise. We're going to play some worship music, come on down and give of your offering. If you even giving electronically, it's always good just to tap it on the uh, basket and say, hey, I'm sowing into the things that God's decreed today. And uh, we're going to be blessed just to chew on this word for a while. And I hope it makes a difference in how you live your life from day to day, as well as to understand the times that we're living in in the earth. All right. The Lord bless you as you give. <laughs> 